The Cincinnati Bengals win in Vegas without the benefit of an explosive passing game. We'll talk about what went right, what went wrong, and how the defense contained the Raiders in our All-22 review. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko, joined by our regular All-22 review guest, Mike Santagata, at Bengals Sands on Twitter. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button for our five times a week daily episodes covering the Cincinnati Bengals. Although, a quick programming note that we will be missing Thanksgiving Day. There will be no podcast on Thanksgiving Day this week as we deal with The holiday, happy Thanksgiving to those of you that will celebrate. And we're going to talk, Mike, today about passing offense, rushing offense, and defense. Those are going to be the broad categories of our discussion today. And let's start with passing offense in this game because the Raiders, by and large, have not been great defending the pass this year. They obviously have some pass rushers in Yannick Ngakwe and, more importantly, Max Crosby, who had his fair share of wins against Riley Reef And... Maybe that's where we should start because early in the game and in the second quarter in particular, it seemed like seemed like Max Crosby was getting the best of Riley Reef pretty consistently. What was it that was giving Riley Reef so many problems? Is there anything he could have done differently? And it looks like the Bengals adjusted the rest of the way in the second half. What did they do to adjust to the early beatings? Ooh, yeah, uh, early on, they started out the nice thing about having a reef and a Jonah is that either one can be on the Island in theory, <laughs> but Max Crosby was giving reef so much trouble that he probably wasn't allowed. He not probably they weren't allowing him to take Crosby on alone one-on-one without help anymore. Uh, just because he was, I mean, Crosby was throwing out some crazy moves, just Euro steps into spin moves and getting the ice pick at the end to make sure vault him towards the quarterback and uh, move reef out of the way even more. Um, he has a really nice move set and early on really, to me, it looked mostly just like they weren't giving him chip help because they like to let the tight ends run free. Um, they did give a chip to Jonah once. And that was the first sack with the difference between an early chip and a late chip is on an early chip. You get a tight end to get his hands on a guy early and, slow him down so he can't get up field and speed rush down the field early. So the tackle has an easy job, but then you have a late chip and that's with a running back who's coming out of the backfield. Who's going to scan, look to make sure nobody's coming on that side. And then he's just going to give a little shove at, as he heads out onto his route. And when I believe it was P Ryan, I could be wrong on that. Did that to Yanni Kangakwe. Uh, Jonah had him and then the chip, Ngakwe used that with momentum to go inside as Jonah couldn't react fast enough. And that was the strip sack. And whew, it's it's hard when you're playing tackle to try to tell somebody like, I don't need the chip, but you need to explain like, I don't need this late chip. I, I need, I, I'll take any other chip, you know, a tight end or a running back early to get their hands on a guy. But that late chip often causes trouble. Um, later on, they gave Reef a ton of early chips to, help him out against Crosby because Crosby was just, I mean, he was on his game uh, there. I, he could have done things better, but it's like not a lot of tackles would have held up against what he was throwing at him on obvious passing situations. And it was early when Crosby did most of his damage. PFF only had him charted for three total pressures in the game. And two of them came actually, one of them was a race by uh, an offsides penalty an offsides penalty on which Joe Burrow took a sack anyway. They didn't even get a fun free play out of it where they could take a shot because, uh, again, that Euro step spin move you talk about. The ice pick, uh, just to explain that, is when you're coming around on the spin move, they're getting an elbow or, in Crosby's case, their entire arm into the back if if that spin move is executed properly into the back of the tackle and pushing them in the back as they come off the spin move, which is why you see Riley Reef like two yards inside Max Crosby when he finishes the move and really no chance to recover. So 
I guess there was the, the fourth pressure there that didn't end up counting because of the offsides penalty that was unrelated to Crosby's win on that play. But a good adjustment, I think, to start giving some help early in the snap, as you mentioned, on that side of the field. And even, I think, throughout the game, they went max protect a couple of times. It didn't work out great. Uh, and that was on some play action concepts early. They also kept in a running back a little bit more often. But as you say, when it's that late chip, it's almost like Jonah Williams wasn't expecting the help at that point. And when you're that deep, you know, you're nine yards deep in the pocket, ready to run Yannick Ngakwe around the back of the pocket. You're not really expecting somebody to come in and push the guy forward. And Williams couldn't recover in time. And, and so that led to the meeting at the quarterback. But how about passing offense in terms of the ideas? It looked like there was a very clear game plan here. Early, they tried to go under center play action and the Raiders didn't look interested. It was like the the most non-reaction to play action I think I've seen against the Bengals this year. Some of that could be the play fake. They weren't terribly persuasive play fakes from Joe Burrow and Joe Mixon together. Uh, but beyond that, you know, they, they stayed home and – it looked like the other big part of the Bengals passing game plan was go after the weak links and Casey Hayward wasn't getting targeted and Nate Hobbs wasn't getting targeted a ton, but I thought they did a pretty good job of manufacturing the matchups they liked with their good players. Yeah. And one thing to note is that they really, I think they took the idea of we're not getting Tyler Boyd involved enough to heart because I mean, I think he had five targets and a jet sweep in the first half. <laughs> so they, wanted to get him involved and like you mentioned they weren't going at those guys they were going at Paraman uh at linebacker and once in a while they went at Littleton too but they preferred Paraman um so you have them going after the weak links and some of it's that the pocket didn't hold up every time they want to take that deep shot against with Chase on facing and Burrow's just getting hit right as he throws it and it ends up being short and nobody can find it. Um, yeah, that issue. The other one, they went at him three times on those deep shots. One of them, Mo Rig got over the top. It was cover three. The readers mainly just play cover three. So I almost don't even need to say it, but he got over the top and was able to break it up. I thought it was just a tad late and underthrown, but it was also off of under center play action. And he had to step in, he had to stop running, st set his feet and step into it. So it makes sense why he's late. And then uh, the last one, Chase had a chance at it, but that was honestly pretty good coverage by facing to face guard him and get his hands in there, try to force a one handed catch. So they went at him and he was tested and he did give up some catches, but on the deep shots, he held up. And that was, that was what was important to limiting the Bengals passing game to, for the weak links to hold up. And well, Abrams did give up the touchdown. That was a cover two. And he just didn't follow chase to the corner of the end zone. <laughs> I don't know if he thought he had the recovery speed to maybe bait it into a pick or something, but he didn't. <laughs> yeah. He's not that guy. And you would like to see chase win some of those vertical balls a little bit more often. But as you mentioned, some of it was disrupted by pressure as well. And they did find other ways to get chase involved. Obviously the two jet sweeps. Uh, the other one that is notable is again, they go to the dragon concept when chase is isolated and get free yards on a slant with the, the, the other part of the dragon concept is a slant and behind it, you have a flat route from the running back and, Again, this week, I thought that went well. Are there other areas you would like to see them attack a little bit more with Jamar Chase to get him involved if the vertical game isn't working as it hasn't been for the last few weeks? I really think he'd be a great screen guy, like perimeter-type screens. They ran those in the preseason, it seemed, a lot, and they haven't run a ton of them during the regular season. But, yeah, getting Jonah and Spain or Reef and Adenogy to out wide jailbreak type screen they ran one to uzoma but they haven't run one to chase i think chase is really good after the catch it's underrated in him he's just got such strong legs kind of built like a running back that arm tackles don't bring him down like some wide receivers so he can run through some contact he's fast he's got pretty good vision good change of direction all that lines up with yeah maybe we should get this guy a few perimeter screens and let's see if he can get to work that way the only other thing I want to mention in the passing game on third and short twice, they went to some really nice pick plays. Uh, I think 
Matt Minnick has him clipped. I don't know if you do too, but I saw that Matt Minnick clipped him. I responded to at least one of them where they're timing routes and they're very, very close a couple of times. I think the CBS announcing crew pointed it out once. The ball had to be out quick because otherwise you're going to get called for OPI. But in both cases on those third and ones, I thought the Bengals did a really nice job with good design to get free yards in short yardage situations using the passing game on the perimeter as an extension of the running game. And speaking of the running game, let's go there next where the Bengals really seemed intent on attacking the Raiders on the perimeter instead of up the middle and made some adjustments and stuck with the running game to keep it going in the second half. All right, Mike, straight into the running game. We go early in the game was tough sledding for Joe Mixon. There were some runs that were there, but in particular one drive that stands out is with the assistance of some penalties, they score a touchdown anyway, but there's some really bad negative runs, three negative first down runs on a touchdown drive, and they overcome it with some help, as I mentioned, from the Raiders. But what did you see from the Bengals in terms of how they wanted to attack the Raiders in the first half and how they became more successful as the game went on? Yeah, in the first half, it seemed like they wanted to pound duo, which is basically power without a pooler. And they were running, when I saw the jet, the jet motion and they didn't hand off the jet sweep, in my mind, I just assumed like, oh, they're, they're running wide zone with that, but they were running duo with it, um, which was interesting and didn't really work because while the Bengals offensive line has, they have some talent. And I think one of the issues they might have is moving guys vertically on these double teams. And I wouldn't remove the duo play in general because I think it does work from time to time, especially in shotgun as a way to get to the same side when they're setting the three technique away from the running back. That's a good look for it. But when you're just trying to pound that with the jet motion, to me, I think they're better at wide zone stuff and getting pushing guys ver uh, horizontally and getting out using their athleticism that most of them are pretty athletic dudes. Um, to go with that, Actually, on that drive you were talking about, they score on the great wineback play with Stanley Morgan lead blocking. Earlier on that drive, I believe it was on a second down before the penalty, they ran wineback with Uzoma leading, and it was kind of obvious they were running something like that because Uzoma was in, they were under center with Uzoma inside of the tackle off, like right behind him, basically. It was like, well, he's probably cutting across the formation here uh, and they tried to run it and reef gets beat actually. And then that ends up Uzoma tries to take him, but then there's just too many guys. Uh, they ran it four times. They ran wine back four times in this game. And the only one that worked was the Stanley Morgan lead block play, which great job from him. Basically a, a fullback there. <laughs> uh, but like you mentioned, they attacked the perimeter and especially as the game went on, they changed things up a little bit. They ran crack toss a few times, but they, I think they started adding that jet motion a little bit to kind of move linebackers, especially in that lineback play. And then when it came to the crack toss and toss plays are running, they still want to get Jonah out wide because he's an athletic guy. He can seal guys. He can maul them. He can do anything out there. He's fast. And then they started moving a full motioning, a fullback in, uh, sample i think mostly i think might have been one uzoma play they motion the fullback in he's leading the way as well so they get the pooler they get the same little kind of a crack block but i mean they're not going for the big showy crack block they just kind of seal them off tyler boyd uh you don't need to lay them out uh but you get the fullback and you get jonah leading the way and that was one of the big plays was Mixon is kind of jogging behind them because he's he's faster than those guys, but he's waiting for them to set up the block patience and they end up sealing their guys. And then he turns on the jets sprints up field and makes a couple guys miss turns into a big gain. So I thought that move was interesting. I thought it was good work to bring in a fullback for those plays to get a lead blocker to go with the lead block from the tackle. It seemed like, Perhaps there was more emphasis on the wide zone. As you kind of point out, they were more duo heavy early. Next Gen Stats has a stat on this. 98 of his 123 rushing yards, according to Next Gen Stats, for Joe Mixon were outside the tackles, including both touchdowns. I guess they're judging that that 
second touchdown where it's wide zone to the right and he cuts it behind Jonah Williams on the left side on the back side as technically outside the tackles because the entire offensive line ends up <laughs> outside the right hash uh, yeah. starting on the starting on the right hash uh the, this the ball was snapped from the right hash so I guess that counts as outside the tackles even though it's kind of a cut back uh to the very weak side of the play or, or back side of the play but uh, I just find it interesting that they had so much success outside where the Raiders pass rushers love to get up the field they're very good at pass rushing. They they haven't been as good in run defense, but it's not like they're interior. Although Jonathan Hankins had a pretty good game, I thought, and used his size pretty well against the Bengals interior, had a hard time moving him. Uh, I thought the Bengals would have more success coming right up the middle of these guys, and, and instead they found it outside, which I found to be pretty interesting. But as you said, it seemed like getting the, the fullback with Jonah Williams in space really seemed to help on the toss plays later in the game. They love the toss play too because of exactly what you're talking about. Ron Marinelli, since he's been in the league for like 50 years, has always loved getting penetration. He's kind of – it's kind of the dying art. That, that used to be what everybody liked until very, very recently was, well, get the penetration and you'll disrupt the play. Now they kind of like guys to slow play it and you're going to play this gap and this gap. But – uh there was a few plays on the crack toss stuff where, I mean, Crosby's just taking himself out of the play. He's just running up field and they just go right around him. They almost didn't need to block him at all. Uh, so I understand the game plan and it ended up working when they started bringing in the fullback to help block on that is just, they do have those linebackers that are pretty fast. Even if they're going at him a little bit in coverage, they, they're, they can still fill pretty quickly. So you, you get a guy coming from depth to help take that. And that's makes it a little bit easier on them. Denzel Perriman has always been a pretty good run defender, a great hard hitting kind of linebacker compared him a little bit to Ray Maluga in terms of play style, even if he's, I don't know, a different player. Obviously every, every player has their individual uniqueness to them, but uh, let's talk the Jamar chase jet sweep real quick, because one of them went well and the other one went poorly and it was widely panned as a poor play call. And at that point, if you're reading Bengals Twitter, it seems like everyone thinks Zach Taylor's a terrible play caller again. In terms of play calling <laughs> and that specific play, to me, it looks like there's some execution issues more than there are play calling issues. It, it looks like, yeah, there's some plays they called where, you know, the Raiders didn't bite on play action or, you know, they go max protect and, and send verticals down the field and there's nothing really open. And there's sometimes they just kind of got got. But let's talk about those two things before we shift to the defense the the jet sweep and what you thought of play calling on sunday yeah so the jet sweep that failed they came in with isaiah prince along the offensive line as well and they're running it to his side and he just can't reach abram which i talked about him earlier as he didn't cover chase well there he's still a really good run defender and he just runs right around Prince on that jet sweep. They they don't block, I think it was Crosby, they don't block the end, and they just try to get upfield to help block the second level. And, I mean, if that block's made, that could be going for a big gain. Just like the other one went for, what, a, I want to say eight yards, but it could be more. Um, he got some good blocks. Tyler Boyd made a great block on that play. Uh, downfield, I think, was Higgins. I'm not positive, <laughs> so I won't, say, I won't say who it was. Um, but yeah, they, he got some good blocks from the wide receivers there. They didn't have the extra offensive linemen, and maybe it's a little bit of a tell when you bring in the extra offensive linemen and you jet motion that way. Like They might be running a jet sweep to the guy that they brought in here just to block. <laughs> and what did you think about play calling in general? In general, honestly, I think it. they ran some beaters. It's just that the Raiders weren't falling for any play action. So they, they ran play action four verticals with a bender from T and I mean, Littleton doesn't bite at all. He just immediately gains depth and he's able to pick up T on the bender. He just, he runs with him because he's a good athletic linebacker, but I mean, he has great leverage to pick it up. He's in a great yeah. spot. He's already deep. You can't throw it over him. His back's not even turned until it's too late. So they were ready for the cover three beaters, which makes sense when you're a cover three team to be ready for the things people are going to throw at you. I thought it was fine for the most part. I like the adjustments to the second half, which is something that's been common that they've struggled a little bit early, but later on they 
pull it together and yeah, they're, they're not biting on play action. So let's run the ball. And <laughs> that seemed to work. They moved to the wide zone, which I thought was a good idea. I honestly, I wasn't exactly sure whether I preferred duo over wide zone to a team that plays that over front. Cause you've got bubbles in the front to run your wide zone compared to like a bare front where everybody's covered. So you get your double teams and you can really displace guys just like on that touchdown to the backside C gap outside the tackles. Uh, I thought wide zone would have, should have been heavy, heavily featured early, but they also probably like the play action game off of the duo concept because it's a, you're not getting bulls on parade. You're getting some doubles and then you can just work off that as like real pass protection. It ends up working a little bit more like a real pass protection. Right. I, I'll just say this for, for the play calling as well. There are a number of times the Bengals got the matchup they wanted. They got, Jamar Chase against Jonathan Abram for a touchdown. They got Jamar Chase against Brandon Face on a number of times, singled up deep. They just didn't hit him. They got Tyler Boyd against linebackers a number of times. Tyler Boyd against Abram again, I, I think once or twice. So they were getting the matchups they wanted. And I think that deserves some credit. I thought they had some nice play designs on uh, some of those third and shorts. And the lineback touchdown with the jet sweep has been successful for them a couple of times now in the red area. And you got to credit them for sticking with that. Coming up next, we'll talk defense and how the Bengals held the Raiders in check for pretty much all of the game, just missing out on that one drive when they let Darren Waller beat them vertically a few times. Before we do that, we talked about it earlier in the show. It's Thanksgiving. There's going to be a bunch of football coming up on Thursday, and nothing goes better with football than Turkey, of course. And if you're a better, bet online. They've got you covered for all of your holiday season betting, more props, more odds, and more lines than they've ever had before. They're your number one spot for sports action this Thanksgiving on their new updated website. And when you sign up today, you'll get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Free money. Love free money. Use promo code LOCKDOWN when you sign up to get that welcome bonus. And it's not just football. Maybe despite you being a ravenous Bengals fan, you're not as into things happening on Thursday in the football world, like Detroit, Chicago, who cares, right? Well, bet online has you cover for pro and college hoops as well. They've got NHL going on boxing and UFC. So don't wait to take advantage of all their amazing offers in the 2021 season. Go check them out. BetOnline.ag, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online is stuffed with deals this Thanksgiving. All right, Mike, let's talk defense a little bit. We've seen the defense have some slippage, some pretty significant slippage, I'd say, in the last couple of weeks. They struggled to close out the game against a pretty bad Jets team, got beat underneath the whole game, didn't really try to get creative after some creepers early. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago against the Browns. It was just kind of out of hand from the start. Defense really behind the eight ball. In this game, similarly, the defense started the game behind the eight ball and the Bengals offense gave the ball away. They gave up points on their first drive and the defense starting in their own red area after an offensive giveaway. What did the defense do this week? I know Darren, Darren Waller got his, but what did they do well this week to help stop what can be at times an explosive Raiders offense that's been struggling a little bit the last few weeks? Yeah, they got a little bit more disguise heavy, which is something that I was hoping they were going to do against the Jets, uh, something I was hoping they were going to do more against the Browns. And instead of just lining up in what they're going to play and playing it, they disguised a little bit, especially when it came to third down, where really the Raiders were 0 of 6, but they got one throw to Renfro with two minutes left in the fourth quarter, so it ends up being 1 of 7. Um, a lot of three safety sets, which always interesting to me. Uh, sometimes that just means they're pulling Pratt out and they're playing Von Bell at linebacker. That's probably more on like a second down where maybe it's not a true mix down, which I mean, you could pass or run reasonably from there. Third and two, second and five. But uh, maybe on type, those type of downs, they'll bring Von Bell into the box and play linebacker. But sometimes when it came to third and long, uh, specifically one play, I just really loved it, was they played three high safeties. And that is confusing for a quarterback because typically you see the two safeties and that's where your read starts. You see, do they, if they're both high, do they both go out? Does, do they 
spin, one deep, one underneath. Um, either way on that. And I did a doodle of it. It's a drop eight, so I, I think everybody's going to be upset because they only rush three. <laughs> but I just let, really like the design of this. Now, it's just little zones. It doesn't – you don't just go to your spot and drop for the most part. I mean, drop eight you, sometimes – if you're dropping a guy from the line of scrimmage, he'll do that. But so you see what I really want you to focus on is at the top here. You see the three safeties, both the middle one was Bates and the one over here was Von Bell. And the other one is Ricardo Allen. And what they did there was they wanted to get that post safety, the deep middle of the field. But instead of just lining up in cover three, playing cover three, they started with three high safeties where they can do anything. They could play cover two and drop Bates in the middle as a robber. They could play, some type of single high, just like they did. So instead of just having Bates drop deep and letting those two guys come down and play either the curl flats or the hooks, they sent Allen deep. They sent Bates over. It kind of looks a little bit like cover two because you have Bell and Bates expanding wide, but with Ricardo Allen going deep, that it just gives the quarterback a little bit of pause. And he wasn't pressured because they only rushed three. Very cool coverage, though. I really enjoyed that. It ends up being that deep throw that Awuja has great coverage on and breaks it up. I mean, if they were calling things really ticky-tacky, maybe they call that DPI. But to me, I thought that was just really good coverage. Um, other than that, yeah, they played – they sugared up the linebackers a few times. And sometimes from uh, – both those were in three safety sets. They sugared the linebackers to the B-gaps on third down, showed cover zero with the flat – across the birds on a fence post, whatever you want to call that picket fence. Look, all the DBs are in the same spot and they dropped a cover two on both of them. This is actually the play they gave up uh, first down on. So they weren't just lining up in cover two and playing cover two either with two minutes left. They were still lining up in cover zero and a three safety set and playing Tampa two. It was just too soft. Uh, Renfro just sat underneath, but thought that was interesting just a lot of stuff like that so i mean what i'm describing here is just things that'll confuse a quarterback like Derek carr is a pretty smart quarterback but when you're getting these exotic type looks and three safety sets and these are huge in college i thought they're going to use this last year with sean williams but he never really took off like ricardo allen seems to be um just gives that quarterback the extra hits the extra pause to say like what what coverage am i getting here what is going on and eventually they'll figure it out, but it's just an extra hitch gives, gives your pass rushers a little extra time gives, uh, makes them a little bit late on a throw, you know, those type of things. So great coverage, uh, a lot of disguise, a lot of movement. And that's what I like to see from this defense. Yeah. And I think in terms of individual performances, we probably should talk about Eli Apple's interception. We should talk about Sam Hubbard having a pretty nice game overall. He, he had some issues, uh, early, but I thought, you know, later on, he had a really good run stop. Trey Hendrickson had a pretty nice game as a pass rusher, including a, a sack fumble to help close out the game, as did Sam Hubbard have a sack preceding that sack fumble. And Trey Hendrickson was going against a good tackle. Colton Miller, the, the Raiders left tackle has come a long way, and he still got his, did Trey Hendrickson, with those four pressures, including that, that sack fumble to really – the game was already pretty well out of hand, but really ice the game and take away any any doubt. I tweeted that the game was in garbage time at that point, and people got mad at me because it was a two score game. <laughs> the Raiders had three timeouts. They were uh, they were driving. They were getting ready to make it a one score game, but instead Trey Hendrickson really puts it out of reach. But how about Eli Apple's interception? I thought that was a really nice play for him to go with the really nice play for a Wouzier earlier, which. By the way, I think I said this yesterday on the show. I didn't think there was any way he was getting called for DPI because I thought he did a good job of looking up and finding the ball instead of trying to play through the guy. And the throw also carries out of bounds. I'm sure that's a factor. But I think if he doesn't get his head up and his eyes on the ball, that's much more likely to invite the flag. But Eli Apple's pick is a, a looks like a, a play where he's responsible for, for the flat but does a good job of getting depth and is somewhere where Derek Carr is not expecting him to be. Yeah, the, well, they ran cover two, and on that you have two deep safeties split down the middle. Middle of the field's open. That's why they call it middle field open. But what the, what the corner is going to do is technique is usually cloud technique, and so he's going to be usually pressed up against the receiver, sometimes jam, sometimes doesn't jam. I don't believe he jammed on the play. Uh, 
he's looking to the inside because he's looking for a flat route coming out, but the Raiders don't have anything coming out. So Eli Apple plays textbook. I'm going to keep sinking uh, because this could be a comeback. This could be anything. And I have help over the top, but I don't want to screw him over with a deep outbreaker. And that's what they ran. They ran a deep outbreaker and Carr not expecting Eli Apple to do that. Maybe because he didn't think, maybe he didn't see that on tape with Eli Apple that he sinks real well uh, in cover two when there was nothing holding him there, but he did and threw it right, basically right at him. I mean, really athletic play to jump up there. You can see he was a first round pick with that jump and catch and maybe not the fumble, but I mean, that was the field a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, just really awesome play there from the cornerback to just keep sinking. Just, just find the feel really just feel the deep outbreaker and try to get underneath that to help. It was Von Bell on that side and Von Bell's playing over the top, and he's fine there. Waller's not – yeah, I think it was Waller. Waller's not getting over the top of him, but what he can do is just sit underneath, come back. He's got great leverage for that type of stuff, anything outbreaking. And, yeah, Eli Apple, really good job to sit underneath it. And I will just go to the bat real quick for Colton Miller on the strip sack. I think he got beaten clean by Trey Hendrickson plenty of times in this game. He was dual reading on that. He was kind of screwed. He was on his own on an island trying to read linebacker to Trey Hendrickson, and Trey Hendrickson's too good for you to be doing that to. So he ends up going almost untouched to the quarterback on the strip sack. But I just go to bat for my offensive lineman. <laughs> yeah, but you also have to go to bat for Trey Hendrickson on the play too, right? And, yeah, and you did. To you get know, the strip. As you say, he, he's too good for, for that sort of thing to put your tackle in a disadvantageous situation. And that's a, that's a big play in the football game to really – take any doubt away uh the last note i'll say i'll just throw out here before we get out of here is i thought tackling was much better and pff seems to agree they had the bengals down for just five missed tackles in this game and uh two of those were jermaine pratt which of course we've talked about his grip strength that's uncharacteristic for him but great tackling from the defensive line in the secondary and that goes a long way uh they, they did have some missed tackles i think on the big josh jacobs run a little bit later in the game but um, for the most part, tackling like this is going to be a lot better. And the other note, I guess, that we should talk about that I meant to talk about yesterday is the Bengals outpossessed the Raiders nearly two to one in this game. And I think that was just really important to, to <laughs> not let the Raiders establish the kind of rhythm they wanted to establish and didn't give them more chances to convert third downs later in the game and, and kind of find their way. As you see teams sometimes struggle with third downs for a while and then figure it out later. Uh, the Bengals didn't really give the Raiders that opportunity in this game. So uh, I think that that did matter quite a bit, their ability to control the clock with the running game, especially later in the game. And it shortened the game in a way that the Raiders didn't have enough chances to come back. And the Bengals run away with it, with it at the end instead of the Raiders having those chances to come back. So some good stuff this week. I, I like the defensive disguise notes. I, I like the run game notes. And Hopefully some stability on this offensive line. I think Riley Reef, we know what he is. Good game from the interior offensive line. I thought Jonah Williams mostly had a pretty nice game too. So if they can settle in in pass protection, I think Bengals fans are pretty happy going forward. And another stiff test, of course, coming up with the Steelers this week. And we'll start to shift our focus to Steelers week number two. James will be back tomorrow. Until then, Bengals fans, for Mike, find him on Twitter at Bengals Sands. I'm Jake Hude, and have a good one.